Well, let's get started. Okay, can everybody see my first slide? It says chemistry, second edition, chapter 12, kinetics. Yes. Wonderful, thank you very much. Okay, so again, while you're following along with the video or if you're in class with me, live lecture right now, which I recommend, um, things that you're gonna wanna have with you at all times, if you haven't printed out the slides already, I would recommend you gotta have a minimum, a pencil, a calculator, and some scratch paper. OK, so that you can always try and work problems because we're going to spend a good chunk of time going through practice problems in this class. All right. So chapter 12, first chapter in general chemistry two deals with kin kinetics or the rate of reaction. So we're going to cover all of the sections of this chapter, all the sections that are found in the OpenStax chemistry second edition textbook. All right, let's start with section 12.1, which deals with chemical reaction rates. You might remember from general chemistry, we spent a good chunk of time talking about thermodynamics and things like enthalpy and the energy of a system. OK, and we what we did in thermodynamics is we compared the energy of the products in reactants and we can determine if a reaction is energetically feasible. So whether the reaction is feasible or not. Now, if a reaction is feasible, that's that's great. That's wonderful. But there's another question that we have to ask ourselves. And that question is, even if the reaction is feasible, what kind of speed or rate does this chemical reaction progress at? Meaning, is this reaction going to progress you know, quickly or slowly? Is it something that might be useful for us? Something that a reaction that could occur over a course of minutes or maybe hours, even days? Or is this reaction going to be so slow that it might take longer than our lifetime? All right, so that wouldn't be, even if it's a reaction that that it's uh, energetically feasible, it's a reaction that is not feasible in terms of the reaction rate. Well, you might wonder, you know, again, like how do the two relate, thermodynamics and kinetics? Well, this is the summary of what I just said. Even though a reaction might be energetically feasible and can occur spontaneously, it might be extremely slow and therefore of very little use to a chemist, okay? So when we're looking at a chemical reaction, not only do we have to consider the thermodynamics, but we also have to consider the kinetics or the rate at which the chemical reaction is going to occur. Here's an example. At, it says at room conditions or at room temperature, so standard temperature and pressure, 25 degrees Celsius would be room temperature and you know one atmosphere. Thermodynamic calculations tell us that diamond is going to change into graphite spontaneously. That means that diamonds are going to rearrange their molecular, their, their structure, they're going to be converted into graphite, which is essentially dust, right? So diamonds go to graphite spontaneously. Now you might think, well, uh oh, do I have to worry about my diamond ring or my diamond earrings or the diamond in my watch or something? And the answer is no, you don't have to stress about that too much because even though the, the reaction is energetically feasible, the kinetics of the reaction is so slow, okay? It is unobservable over hundreds and maybe thousands of years, okay? Such a slow reaction that we, it's something we don't even consider. You know, I don't say, hey, let's wear the, make sure to wear your diamonds because, you know, they're going to be turned into graphite next week. No, it is a thermodynamically feasible reaction, but in terms of the reaction rate, it's just too darn slow. So that is going to be the focus of this chapter, reaction rates. How long does it take for a chemical reaction to occur? Something to think about. Something that you never thought about probably a whole lot in general chemistry one. Well, let's move on. Let's take a look at a reaction. I have a reaction shown right here. This is just a simple reaction. Magnesium reacting with hydrochloric acid to form magnesium chloride. It says it's aqueous. That means that that ionic compound is dissolved in the water and it also forms hydrogen gas. This is a reaction that I'm sure that many of you have even tried. Okay, you just take a little strip of magnesium you put it in HCl and you start to see bubbles form right away. And those bubbles are hydrogen gas. Well, let's think about this reaction for a second. The rate of the reaction is the appearance or disappearance of any of the chemical species in this reaction that's shown here with time. Right, we could think about this reaction in terms of, well, where's my thing? There it is. You know, how long does it take for the magnesium or the HCl to disappear? 
right? Because the reaction is going from products to, or sorry, from reactants to products. Getting ahead of myself here. From reactants, right? The product. So I could measure it in terms of the disappearance of the reactants, but I could also measure it in terms of the appearance of the product, couldn't I? Right? Either one would be totally acceptable. Well, for this reaction, the rate can be measured using what's called a rate expression. Now, these are just some examples, okay? And we're going to look more at rate expressions as the chapter progresses. But for example, we could measure the rate as the change in concentration of the magnesium chloride. Look, the magnesium chloride is an aqueous solution. So there's no reason we couldn't measure the concentration of the magnesium chloride and just measure the change of that magnesium chloride over time. Right? That, that would be a perfectly reasonable way to measure the rate of the reaction. What's another thing that we could do? We could measure it in terms of the change of the magnesium. Right? Look, the magnesium is a solid. Look. Magnesium solid. Well, if you you know were to weigh the magnesium at different points throughout the reaction, which might not be easy to do, but it could be done, you could measure the rate of the reaction by looking at the rate of disappearance of the magnesium. So again, we can measure the reaction rate in terms of disappearance of a reactant or production of a product. Now, what's important that you understand is that reaction rate is measured as a positive number. Okay, it's always going to be a positive quantity. Whenever we write down a reaction rate, it's always going to be a positive number. So since it's going to be a positive quantity, when we measure the rate as the disappearance of a reactant, we put a negative sign in front of it. Why? Because the change in the reactant is going to be a negative number, right? We go final minus initial. So if the concentration of a reactant is decreasing, we're going to go a small number, subtract a big number. So that means there's going to be a negative number in here, a negative times a negative gives you a positive. Okay, so that's why with respect to reactants, we always put a negative in front. So that's just kind of one of the things that you have to remember because reaction rate is measured as a positive quantity. Now, again, to summarize this, you know, to really kind of just boil it down to brass tacks, you can measure the rate as the change. That's what the delta means. These square brackets here, these mean concentration. So you can measure it as the change in concentration of the product over time, or the negative of the change of the concentration of the reactant over time. Again, the negative is there to force this rate to be a positive quantity. Now you might be wondering, you know, I'm used to rates like dollars per hour. You know, I know how many dollars per hour I earn in my job, or how many miles I can travel in an hour, you know, and I'm in my car and I'm going 60 miles an hour. I know, I understand that rate. What's the rate that we measure? You know, what would the units of a reaction rate be, Mr. Dion? And the answer is moles per liter per second, right? Concentration, concentration is measured as moles per liter. That's something you would have learned in general chemistry one, right? Moles per liter, which is molar, the big M. So if it's, the rate is gonna be, measured as concentration over time, this concentration could be, or sorry, this time could be measured in seconds or minutes. So that means that the rate of reaction is usually reported as molar per second, right? If you could write it like this, you could just say moles per liter per second, or you can say molar times seconds to the minus one, okay, times the reciprocal, okay? You could write the whole thing out, moles per liter per second. I don't care. You could write moles per liter per minute. Now, again, the time, that depends on how long the reaction is. And if you're wondering, you know, well, could it be moles per liter per hour, per hour or per day? Yeah, sure, sure, okay. But I would say that 99.9% .9 of the time in this class, it will be per second or per minute. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me thus far. It's like, hey, Mr. Dion, we covered two slides, I'm with you. You know, just if you follow me on the first couple of concepts, all right. Yeah, cool. All right, cool. <laughs> cool. Good. And I, you know what else is nice? I see a bunch of names of people that I don't know, or people that I do know, and I see a bunch of names of people that I don't know. Anyhow, I, you know, one of the hardest things about teaching remotely is not, you know, not getting to know my students' uh, faces, but I'm going to try to learn a lot of your names, and, you know, um, that'll, that'll occur, you know, more throughout the course of, of, of the class, you know, over the 
over the, the course of the semester. Anyhow, good. So we're kind of, seems like I'm getting a lot of thumbs up. So we're kind of all on the same page about reaction rates. And we're going to look at this in even more detail. Look at this figure. This comes straight out of our textbook, okay? So this figure comes straight out of the OpenStack textbook. And if you're like, what is in this figure? Well, let's take a look at it. You know, whenever, there's never a time to panic in chemistry class, right? Always just stop, take a pause, look carefully at what the heck is going on. And what's going on here is a reaction, okay? And this is the reaction right here. This reaction is kind of a common reaction. This is showing the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. H2O2, that's hydrogen peroxide. And you're like, is that the same hydrogen peroxide I can buy down at Costco in the pharmacy, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So hydrogen peroxide decomposes spontaneously into water and oxygen. You might have seen hydrogen peroxide form bubbles sometimes. Well, that's oxygen bubbling out of it. Anyhow, if we look at the reaction of hydrogen peroxide decomposing into water and oxygen, you can see that somebody did a bunch of measurements here, didn't they? They measured over time, in hours, they measured the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide at various times. Okay, so this is a really simple experiment. And here's an example of, instead of somebody using seconds or minutes for the time, they used hours, didn't they? Okay, so over a 24 hour period, this is what the scientist did. The scientist said, I'm gonna measure the concentration of my hydrogen peroxide at T equals 0, 0, 0.00 hours. That means the very beginning of the experiment. And the person started it with one mole, right? 1.000 moles per liter. And then the person found that after six hours, so six hours, they came back and they measured the concentration, and it went down by 0.5, right? It dropped by 0 0.5. That's why they put a negative, right? Because it dropped by that concentration. Then they came back six hours later, and they said, hey, look, the concentration dropped again. It dropped by 0.25. Then they did it again, right? And they kept coming back at these intervals and measuring the concentration of the H2O2. Now, what I want you to think about is, what would the rate of reaction be? Well, you can see that the rate actually varies, doesn't it? If you examine the whole table here, here's our rate, which is molar times reciprocal hours. You can see that that rate changes. Look at how they measured it, right? Now, since we're measuring the rate as the rate of disappearance, Right, because this is a reactant, hydrogen peroxide is a reactant. Remember that we want to put that negative sign here, right? Because if you take 0.5 and you subtract one, what do you get? Negative 0.5. Negative times a negative gives you a positive number. Okay, so if somebody asked you, hey, could you tell me what the rate of reaction was for the first six, first six hours? That means this period here. Well, you'd say it's going to be the negative because I'm measuring the rate as the rate of disappearance of reactant. It's negative 0.5, subtract one, which gives you negative 0.5 times negative, so that gives you 0.5 divided by six. And that gives you this number, 0 0.0833, three sig figs, moles per liter per hour. But look, if we did the exact same exercise during the last six hours, that's this stretch here from 18 to 24, look at this. We go from 0.125 to 0.0625. We still end up with a negative number, but we multiply that by a negative. But look, we get a different reaction rate, don't we? The denominator was the same both times. Look, the denominator here was six hours, and the denominator here was six hours. Right? The delta T didn't change, but the change in concentration did change, didn't it? Okay? Now, I'd say one of the major take-homes here is that the rate of decomposition of H2O2, or hydrogen peroxide, in an aqueous solution, you can see that that rate drops. It decreases as the concentration of the H2O2 decreases. Kind of interesting, huh? Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on from there. And let's take a look at an example. Okay, so this is something, you know, that we're actually going to look at and we're going to solve this ourselves. Now, again, it looks like there's a lot of information on here. It looks like there's a ton of information. And there is quite a bit of information. But look, let's just take a deep breath and think about it very carefully. Let's look. It says, a student carries out the following reaction in a rigid container. The student measures the concentration of A and B and C every two seconds. So this is a reaction and they measured, we're going to measure it in moles per liter per second. 
Okay, now notice that we're have, we have one reactant, don't we? We have one reactant and that's A. Look at the slope of the line for A. So A is purple. Notice that it's decreasing, right? Because A is disappearing. But we have two products, don't we? B and C, and look at those. Those are being produced. So the slope of the line overall, now these are curved lines, but generally speaking, the slope of A is decreasing, right? Well, that makes sense because A is going to be disappearing. It's a reactive, and the slope of B and C is increasing. Also interesting. Now, what we want to do in this question, I have to kind of give myself more room here to see the whole question. But what it's asking us is just something very, I don't like to use the word simple in chemistry class a whole heck of a lot, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with it here. It's asking us to do something kind of simple. It just says, using the data provided here, all the concentrations that were measured at all these two second intervals, calculate the rate of appearance of C over the following time intervals. What's the rate of appearance of C? Well, let's think about that. The rate of appearance of C is going to be this. It's going to be the change in the concentration of C over a certain period of time, isn't it? That's going to be the rate of appearance of C. So this is equal to the rate of appearance of C. Now, if I want to calculate that rate for the time period of 0 to 16 seconds, let's do that. What's my delta concentration of C going to be? Well, from 0 to 16 seconds, you can see, no pun intended, that you go from 0 0.35 molar, 0 0.035 rather, at 16 seconds, and you're starting with 0. Now, if you're thinking, like, how did you start with 0? Remember, C is a product. You had none at the beginning. So let's do that. Now remember that the delta C is going to be the concentration of C final minus the concentration of C initial, right? Over delta T final minus T initial. So let's plug in some numbers here. So for the change in concentration, we've got 0 0.0350 molar, subtract 0 molar, subtract 16.0 seconds, subtract 0, 0.0 seconds. Now I've already gone ahead and done the math here. If, if you need to, I would recommend doing this before class. You take 0, 0.035 divided by 16. You can hear me crunching my calculator. We should only have two sig figs. And when we report this in scientific notation, we get 2.2 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per liter per second. So I'll report it like that. So there's our answer to A. Okay, there's our answer to A. I'm going to go ahead and let's try to do it for an interval of zero to two seconds. So I gave myself a little more room over here. I'm going to write down what A was. Um, you know, try to give myself some room here. A, we said the answer to A was 2.2 times 10 to the negative three moles per liter per second. Now let's try B, okay? B says from zero to two seconds. So again, B is going to be, we're going to measure the rate of being equal to delta, the change in the concentration of C over time. But this is zero to two seconds. So we're concerned with these two columns here. So we've got what, 0 0.011 molar, subtract 0, 0.0 molar. And then we've got um, 2.0 seconds, subtract 0, 0.0 seconds. You know, not really complicated math. It's more about just setting it up. Anyhow, I've already gone ahead and done the math here. And we end up with 5.5 .5 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per liter per second. I keep running in a space to put my units, don't I? Okay, kind of interesting. Now, what do you notice is that the rate of appearance of C seems to be increasing, doesn't it? And if you go back here in this line, you can see, oh, we didn't do C, did we? Okay, here we go. So I've gone ahead and I've done C here. Before I'm getting ahead of myself, what I wanted to say is this. You can see that over these different periods of time, that the reaction rate is different for all of them, isn't it? And so that's something that we've got to kind of consider moving forward, is that all of these are different. So what's our conclusion? Reaction rate is not constant over time. 
what I was what I was trying to say before, kind of gobbled it up there, gargled it up, was that you see that the slope of the lines here change over time, right? You can see the slope of the line here is really steep, and then it kind of evens out over time. Okay, so the conclusion is, where was I? Is that the reaction rate is not constant with time, was it? It just wasn't. And it depends on the time interval we're investigating. Okay. So when we did that whole exercise, which was, you know, didn't take us very long, that whole change in the concentration of X over time, all we were doing, and I'm sure that many of you had this figured out from the get-go, all we were doing was calculating the average reaction rate over that time period. Nothing more than that. If we wanted to determine the rate of reaction at a specific point in time, how the heck would we do that? And if we go back to the slopes, Right. We look at the slope of the appearance of C. So I'm talking about talking about this line right here. You know, what if we didn't want to evaluate the rate of reaction at a over an interval? What if we wanted to get it exactly at nine seconds? Okay. What if we wanted it exactly here? Well, then you'd have to measure the slope right at that point. And if you've ever studied calculus before, you probably understand that. You know, you have to evaluate that. You know, rate right as the time, the change in time approaches zero at that very specific time. So we're not going to worry about calculus. You don't have to have calculus to do this class, okay? But let's just think about it. What would the instantaneous rate be at any point in time for this reaction? Well, if we're talking about a reactant, it's going to be the negative of the slope of the tangent. Of the concentration of that reaction versus a reactant versus time graph. And if we wanted to find the instantaneous rate for a product, it's just going to be the positive of the tangent of the slope. And if you're like, what the heck is a tangent of a slope? What are you talking about, Mr. Dion? Okay, hold on. We're going to look at it even more. But before we move on, I want you to just, you, you got to know some terminology here. Instantaneous rate, that's the time, you know, the, the rate at a specific time. The initial reaction rate, that's going to be the instantaneous rate at time is equal to zero. Let's take a look at a tangent here. Okay, so this is what we mean by a tangent. Okay, what's the, what's the rate of this reaction? This is the same reaction we've been looking at, decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. We looked at it a few minutes ago, I guess. What's the exact reaction rate at 12, at 12 hours, right? Well, you'd have to take the slope of the line at that specific point. And here's the slope here, right? Okay, what's the exact rate of reaction at time is equal to zero hours? Well, you'd have to take the slope of the tangent here, which looks something like that. Okay, so slope of, that's what a slope of a tangent is. Now, of course, since it's, again, and I'm repeating myself, and I'll do that a lot, since we're measuring the rate of disappearance of the hydrogen peroxide, we have to put a negative sign there, right? Okay, so the negative slope going to be equal to the negative change in hydrogen peroxide over time. Okay, so this graph shows a plot of concentration versus time for our one molar solution of hydrogen peroxide that we looked at a few minutes ago. The rate at any instant is equal to the opposite of the slope of the line. Okay, now if you're like, what do they mean by the opposite of the slope? I wouldn't have said it that way. I would just would have said the negative. So multiply it by a negative number because remember, reaction rate, this is this slope is negative, isn't it? Rise over run. Well, there isn't rising, it's going down, right? So you'd multiply that by a negative to give a positive quantity. Anyhow, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the idea of a tangent. The slope of the tangent of the line. All right. Good. I didn't want to go too fast today. We just want to kind of take our time and kind of mosey through, you know, reaction rates a little bit. Here's another reaction, or here's another look at the um, reaction back from slide seven. So if you, I'm jumping around here a little bit. I tend to do that from time to time. So this is the, remember when we looked at this problem just a few minutes ago? So this is the reaction I'm talking about. 2A gives you 2B and 2C. Well, if we think about that reaction even more right here. So it says, you know, using the data on slide seven, the instantaneous rates at eight and five seconds are found. And we're going to worry about how to do that later on. But 
Somebody went ahead and did that, okay? So they measured the instantaneous rate of disappearance of A and the instantaneous rate of appearance of B and C at a specific time. So this is, remember, these aren't delta Ts, are they? This is not a delta T. No, this is at a specific time. This is at eight seconds. This is at five seconds. And you can see here that at both eight seconds and five seconds, the rate of disappearance, this is really important, the rate of disappearance of A and production of B are always twice as much as that of the rate of production of C. Look at the stoichiometry here. Two moles of A gives you two moles of B and one mole of C. And if, you, if you're confused, let me show you again here. Look, if we just examine the data at eight seconds, look at the rate of disappearance and appearance of A and B respectively. They're identical. They both have a coefficient of two. Now C has a coefficient of one, and it's half as much. Okay, so based off of that, we can draw a really interesting conclusion here. We can draw a conclusion that's shown at the bottom of this slide. It says the rate of appearance or disappearance of all species in any chemical reaction that we're going to look at can be related like this. So this is something that you're going to have to have in your hat or your homework practice problems, exam, is this relationship right here. For a general reaction where you have A multiplied by a stoichiometric coefficient, little i, where you have B multiplied by a stoichiometric coefficient, little b, so on and so forth, is equal to, or produces C multiplied by a stoichiometric coefficient C and D multiplied by a stoichiometric coefficient D, the rate of appearance or disappearance for all of these can be related by the following. So the rate of disappearance of A, if we wanted to relate that to the rate of disappearance of B, we would multiply those by the negative of one over the stoichiometric coefficients, and the same thing applies for the product. We would multiply the rate of appearance, of C and D, by one over the stoichiometric coefficient. So this gives you a beautiful and I'd say kind of simple way to relate the rate of disappearance of the product of any reaction to the rate of, sorry, the disappearance of the reactants to the appearance of the product. Okay, so we're going to use this relationship to solve the problem. Let's give it the old college try. Okay, we have a reaction which is two moles of dinitrogen pentoxide produces four moles of nitrogen dioxide and one mole of oxygen. It says write the rate expression in terms of each species. Well, if I want to write the rate in terms of the dinitrogen pentoxide decomposition, I want you to give it a try first. Take a second, take a quick peek at it. See if you can write something down. I'll give you a minute. Well, Let's just write the rate expression in terms of each species here. So since my N2O5 is a reactant, reactant spin, and since everything else is a product, since my N2O5 is a reactant, I'm going to put negative 1 over 2, because the 2 is my stoichiometric coefficient, times the delta of N2O5 times delta T. For my NO2, I'm going to put that the rate of NO2 formation, I'll write a relationship for that, negative 1 over 4 times the change in concentration of NO2 over time and then for my oxygen formation it's simply going to be oops i didn't mean to put a negative there 
it's going to be equal to the change in concentration of oxygen over time. If you're wondering how I did that, I just used the relationship that's found right here. Well, let's try a practice question. I have a lot of practice questions in here, but today's the first day, so let's let's take some time and let's go over this question. It says, consider the reaction. Two NOBR produces two moles of NO and one mole of bromine. The rate of disappearance of NOBR for a given time interval is measured as 0 0.05 moles per liter per second. Calculate the change in the concentration of NO over time and the rate of appearance of BR2 for the same time interval. What's important is that you understand the wording. When it says the rate of disappearance of the NOBR for a given time interval, that means this. That means the rate of disappearance of NOBR, so the change in the concentration of NOBR over time. Okay, that's this specific part of our relationship. Okay, that's the rate of disappearance. It's got nothing to do with the negative one over two. That's a relationship that we use to relate all of the changes in concentration. So delta NOBR over time, that is equal to 0 0.05 moles per liter per second. Now it wants us to calculate delta NO over delta T. So that's what it's asking for, okay? We're asked to calculate that. So before we do that, why don't we develop a relationship to relate the rate of disappearance of NOBR and the rate of appearance of the products, okay? And we've done that already, and we know that it would look something like this, negative one over two times the change in concentration of NOBR over time is equal to one over two times the, I keep forgetting my delta, the delta concentration of NO over delta T times delta BR2 over delta T. There's our relationship. That's going to be our key to solving this problem, isn't it? We're going to use this relationship, okay? And we're going to use this now to solve for the delta NO over delta T. Well, I know that delta NO over delta T, or one half, is going to be equal to negative one half of delta NO BR over delta T, isn't it? So that means. If I multiply this side by two, I'm going to be able to remove this, right? Okay, so now I've simplified it a little bit. So that means that the rate of change in the concentration of NO over time is going to be equal to negative, negative times 0 0.05 moles per liter per second. Okay, now one thing you're going to find in general chemistry two compared to general chemistry one is that I'm going to do a little more mental math and I'm going to skip steps sometimes. So if you're wondering what the hell is going on, right? All I did was multiply negative a half by two and I got negative one. Now, another question that you might be wondering for a good reason is why did you just throw a negative here, Mr. Dion? You didn't put a negative up here, but it's the wording. Remember, it's the rate of disappearance of the NOBR. So it is a negative quantity. So if we multiply a negative by a negative, that means that the rate of appearance of NO over time is going to be equal to, it's going to be equal to 0 0.05 moles per liter per second. Okay, so that's the answer to the first question. Solve the first part. And put a box around it like that. Now, the second part, it's asking us for the rate of appearance of BR2. We're going to use this relationship that one half 
of putting that delta, delta NO ER over delta T is equal to delta ER2 over delta T. So that means that delta BR2 over time is going to be equal to this number multiplied by a half, isn't it? So all we have to do is say um, one half times 0 0.05 moles per liter per second. I have a question for you guys. I haven't asked enough questions. Okay. Could anybody tell me how many significant figures there should be in this answer? It's not a trick question. No, it shouldn't be three. Look at, Jamil, right, look at all the numbers in here. Look at all the numbers in the question. How many numbers are in the question? There's only one number in the entire question. It's this number right here. And there's only one significant figure in that number. So that means that the answer isn't 0 0.025 moles per liter per second. Right? If you write down 0 0.025 moles per liter per second, you have to round that. And you would round that up to 0 0.03 moles per liter per second. And that's the answer for the second part. Now, if you're not following me here, okay, what am I doing? All I did was write down this relationship for this equation, which we looked at on this slide right here. For this general reaction, for a reactant, you multiply the concentration over time by the negative of one over the stoichiometric coefficient. And for a product, we multiply the concentration over time by one over the stoichiometric coefficient. Same thing, okay? So that's all I did here. And I just used that relationship to calculate this and then to calculate this. That was the two parts of the problem. Why is it a half? Think about it, Stephen. Look, if this delta BR over delta, the change in concentration of bromine over time, that's what we're looking for, okay? That's what we're trying to find. If it's equal to one half times this, and we already worked this out, then you multiply it by a half. All right, there we go. Well, let's move on from there. This is a graph that shows the changes in concentrations of reaction, reactants and products for this reaction. I'll write it up here a little bit bigger for you. This is two moles of ammonia gives you three moles of nitrogen and one mole of hydrogen. And what you would notice here is if you look at a specific time, so if we look at time is equal to 500 seconds, and then you look at the tangents, so they measured the tangent of the line for the ammonia right here, so that was for the ammonia. They measured the tangent of the line for the appearance of the nitrogen right here, and they measured the tangent of the line for the appearance of the hydrogen right here. Look at the slopes of those lines. The slopes are directly proportional to the stoichiometric coefficients, two, three, and one. You can see that the hydrogen has a slope that is much steeper, right? Why? Why would that be? It's based off of the relationship that we looked at earlier on. That if we write out a relationship that um, relates the change in concentration over time for the reactants and products, it would look like this negative one half times the change in concentration of ammonia over time is equal to one over three times the constant change in concentration of nitrogen over time, which is equal to the change in concentration of hydrogen over time. Right? 
So it makes sense that the hydrogen slope would be three times as much as the slope of the nitrogen. All right, just something to think about before we move on. And let's move on to the next section, section 12.2, factors affecting reaction rates. The first thing is the chemical nature of the reactants. You know, what makes some reactions faster than others? Why are some reactions slow and some reactions fast? Well, that's kind of the question that we're going to address in this section. The first thing is, again, the chemical nature of the reactants. What, what are they? Right? Example, it says that as you go down the group of the alkali metals, they react faster and faster with water. And if you take this YouTube video, if you take the URL here and you paste it into your web browser, all it is is a demonstration of a scientist throwing lithium, sodium, and potassium in water. Right? So all the scientist is doing is reacting all of these with water. And because they all have different electron affinities, they all have different ionization energies, they're going to react differently with water, aren't they? Right? We know that each one of them has one valence electron. Right? It's going to lose that valence electron. And when it does that, we get an exothermic reaction. And if you're wondering, you know, like, what are you talking about, Mr. Dion? The point is this, is that since we have different metals, they're going to react differently. That's all we're talking about here. Nothing more than that. So you're going to see that when you react with H2O, okay, with H2O, that lithium is going to react the slowest and potassium is going to react the fastest. In fact, it's dangerous. Potassium is very dangerous around water, as is sodium. The next one is the state of the subdivision of the reactants. The rate of most reactions, it says here, increases with increasing surface area. Right? If you have more surface area, then you have more places for the reaction to occur. Take a look at this figure that's shown here. I took this directly from the textbook. It says here you have some iron powder. So this is iron solid, right? And this is iron solid. But they're a little bit different, aren't they? Right? If you look at in A, it's an iron powder, right? This is a powder. So there's a lot more surface area with a powder than there is with a nail. Okay, they're both solid iron, but since the powder has a lot more surface area, it's going to react faster. So that's the second one: is the rate of subdivision of the reactants. To summarize, compared with the reaction rate for large solid particles, the reaction rate for smaller particles is going to be greater because there's more surface area to be in contact with. You know whatever reactant. All right, here we go. So we've got those two. The next one is temperature. I'm sure for a lot of people, that's a no-brainer. Right? They think, okay, well, if I crank up the temperature, the reaction's going to go faster, isn't it? Can everybody still see my slide that says effect on temperature or effect of temperature? Yes. All right, All right great, thanks. Perfect. So if we think about the effect of temperature, this one I think is a pretty knee-jerk reaction for most students. You know, you think about um, turning up the heat in a reaction. Does it go faster? Yeah, because the kinetic energy of molecules in a substance follows a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, as are shown here. We looked at these in general chemistry. And temperature is nothing more than a measurement of the average kinetic energy of molecules. If you look at a bunch of molecules, you know, at different temperatures, let's say we have temperature one, two, and three, and temperature three is the hottest, temperature one is the coldest, and we look at the distribution of the kinetic energy of the particles, what you see is that the curves flatten as the temperature increases. We have a wider range of kinetic energies, but what do we also see? We see that the average kinetic energy at a height, where we have more particles with a high kinetic energy at a higher temperature, right? Than we do at a lower temperature. That's all that really to it here. Right? It says at a higher temperature means more molecules have more energy to overcome the activation energy, and that's going to speed up the rate of a reaction. It's also found that the rate of reaction depends exponentially on temperature. We're not going to worry about that 
in today's lecture, but that's going to come up later on in the class. All right. What about the effect of the reaction pathway or the activation energy? Okay. If you think about um, when we looked at thermochemistry, in general chemistry one, we talked about activation energies and we looked at thermodynamics a little bit in that in that class. Uh, if we think about a simple reaction, okay, we have AB plus C giving A plus B C. So a very simple reaction that's shown here. Okay. This is something that we didn't talk about a ton in general chemistry, but think about what's going on here. Okay. The bond between A and B. This bond here, it doesn't just immediately snap, right? It doesn't just immediately break. It's going to be something that happens where it's put under enough stress so that it's going to break, but it briefly passes through a transition state that we call an activated complex, where the bond isn't really formed and it's not really broken. It's kind of in between, right? The bond is partially broken and partially formed. So the activated complex, here I have it represented like this, you know, the, a or the, C mo the C molecule or atom is going to come into contact with the A and B hard enough to kind of break that bond. It's, it's not broken, but it's not formed either. And you get this transition state, the activated complex. Okay, so this is the activated complex right here. It's very unstable, and it's only going to be formed when stable reactants initially combine on the way to becoming products. The activated complex, it says here, is higher energy than both the reactants and products. Now, this is something that you would have seen a lot of in general chemistry. Our reaction progress diagrams, where we looked at the progress of a reaction. Okay? And we looked at the progress of that reaction with respect to potential energy of the reactants and products. Now, this is an end, looks like an endothermic reaction, doesn't it? Let's follow what's happening here. We have our reactants, then they're going to Follow this pathway. They go up to the activated complex, which is really unstable, and then it's going to form the products. Okay, what's the activation energy? It's the minimum amount of energy that's required to get over that that um, activated complex, or to to get over that activation energy. How should I describe it? It's just You've got to get over that minimum amount of energy that's required to break the bond between A and B and then form your new bond between B and C. All right. So effect of reaction pathway. So what have we looked at so far? Let's back up. Let's review. We've covered the chemical nature of the reactants. We've covered the rate of subdivision of the reactants. Covered the temperature. Increase in temperature is just going to cause an increase in rate of reaction. We've covered the activation energy. That's going to affect the rate of reaction. Now, if we think about when reactants collide, okay, we think about the collision of A and B and C. Let's think about that collision a little bit more. Well, in order for a reaction to occur, they've got to collide with each other hard enough to form the activated complex, don't they? If the Energy that they collide with isn't enough. No reaction is going to occur. So if you're wondering, like, what are you talking about, Mr. Dion? I'm talking about this, that when reactants collide, collisions are great. Collisions are wonderful. But if they don't occur with enough energy, there is not going to be a reaction. For example, we looked at in this figure. Okay, we see all kinds of collisions here that don't lead to a reaction. Why? Because they aren't colliding with enough energy. But then you can see when I have a lot more energy, right? denoted by these longer tails here, that then I get effective collisions, right? That result in a product, okay? All right, so again, to summarize, reactants have to collide with enough kinetic energy to overcome the activated energy, form the activated complex, and then they can become products. Things we wanna think about. What else can affect a reaction rate? A catalyst can affect a reaction rate. You know, if you think about a catalyst, if you've ever used the word catalyst in your everyday conversation to describe a person, what's a catalyst? You know, a catalyst is somebody kind of like a mediator between two people that is unaffected by both of them. Well, a catalyst is the same thing in chemistry. A catalyst is something that's going to speed up the rate of reaction, but it's not going to be affected. It's not going to be consumed by the reaction. So if we look at a simplified way of viewing a catalyst, okay, we have a certain activation energy. Oops. 
we have a certain activation energy associated with our uncatalyzed reaction here. This is our activation energy. If we put in a catalyst, what that does is it alters the pathway of the reaction and it lowers the activation energy. So we call this EA prime. So a catalyst does nothing more than lower the activation energy. It's an important thing that you understand that the catalyst doesn't affect the reactants and products. Those aren't going to change. Okay? It just changes the pathway of the reaction and lowers the activation energy of the reaction. Okay, next, the effect of concentration. Well, it makes sense to me that as concentration increases, so should reaction rate. That's what I have summarized right here. Concentration is proportional co to collision frequency and reaction rate. Say we had a room full of people. Say you had, you know, 20 people in a room. And you got them all blindfolded and told them, start walking around the room. Will there, will there be collisions that occur? Yeah, of course. Let's say you took the same room and you took 100 people and you put them in there and told them, told, told them all to put blindfolds on and walk around the room. Will there be more collisions? You bet your bobby socks there will be. There's going to be a lot more collisions. So it makes sense that the more collisions we have, the more effective collisions we're going to have, and therefore the rate of reaction is going to increase. Now, what it says here at the bottom, it says, not every collision between reacting molecules is going to lead to a reaction. Why would that be? Well, that's what we covered on the last slide. We said because they've got to not only collide, but they've got to collide with sufficient energy. And what we're going to see in the next class is what's called a rate law. We're going to spend a lot of time. In fact, probably the entire next class will spend talking about rate laws. And what we're going to see is that for our simple reaction, where was, it? Where was our simple reaction? Um, uh, oops. For a simple reaction, I'll just write it down here. So if we have a simple reaction like this, we can measure the rate of reaction as being equal to K, which is something we call a rate constant times the concentration of each reaction, each reactant rather, to a specific exponent. And we're going to learn how to determine those exponents in the next lecture. We're going to spend the whole next class probably talking about what are called rate laws. So what I would encourage you to do before coming to the next lecture is to read the entire chapter, especially section 12.3. Jacob, the answer to his question, he says, so basically the catalyst is a way for the reactants to come together without requiring as much energy as it normally would. Absolutely. The thing that the old, and there's nothing wrong with your statement, Jacob, nothing wrong with it at all. The only thing that I want to point out and um, is you noticed something that I kept saying is you probably noticed that I kept saying it changes the pathway, right? I kept saying it changes the pathway. And something that we will look at later on in this class and something that you'll look at even more if you study organic chemistry is what's called a mechanism. And that actually shows you how the particles are colliding, how the bonds are breaking. And what's interesting, Jacob, is that a catalyst not only lowers the activation energy, but it changes the mechanism. So the way that the molecules come together is oftentimes, or most of the time, I would say, from what the examples I can think of off the top of my head, the way they come together will be totally different. Okay, let me repeat that. In fact, let me just go back to the camera here. How do I do that? Stop presenting. Where am I? Look, this is a really simple demonstration. Uh, come to application. Can you guys? Son of a gun. There I am. Okay. So the way that the particles collide, you know, I said they have to collide with enough energy. Well, what the catalyst can do, it can make change the reaction mechanism so much that the particles don't have to collide in the same way at all. So that's just something to keep up here, you know. Um, doesn't orientation also have an effect? Orientation does have an effect, but that's something that's related to what's called collision theory, and we'll look at that more later on in the chapter. All right.